Hello there. My name is Rosie Goldsmith and welcome to Rock Talks, our conversation series featuring literary rock stars from both Romania and Britain. These live hour-long conversations are part of our four-week literature festival, Romania Rocks, brought to you by the Romanian Cultural Institute in London and the European Literature Network. This is the final week of our festival and we have some tremendous events lined up for you, so please do visit our festival program on our RCI and ELNet websites. The idea behind Rock Talks is to bring together some of Romania's greatest living writers with their equally brilliant British counterparts. Writers, we think, have something in common, even though they may never have met and come from very different cultures and countries. And this is a reminder, first of all, that all our festival events are free and they're all filmed by London Video Stories, which means that you can watch everything again on our YouTube channel for free, of course. For example, Deborah Levy talking to Magda Carnage, Ben Okri in conversation with Norman Mania, Fiona Sampson with Anna Blandiana. They're quite remarkable and revealing interviews and they're all different. You can buy most of their books too in English and Romanian from our dedicated independent bookstore, bookstores, all listed on our website. Now, today's Rock Talk is devoted to two authors and thinkers who are as well known in their home countries as they are internationally, Elif Shafak and Matai Vishnik. Welcome to both of you. They both left their homelands, Turkey and Romania, under duress. They both know censorship. They both write in two languages, Matai in French and Romanian, and Elif in Turkish and English. And they're successful in both languages too, and translated into many other languages. Today, they live in two of Europe's great cities, in Paris and in London. Their adopted homes for the last several decades, but with Istanbul and Bucharest, I'm sure, constantly on their minds. Uh, welcome to my digital sitting room, dear Elif and Matai. And um, what would you like? Tea, coffee, glass of champagne, glass of wine? I can get it for you virtually, <laughs> um, but maybe afterwards, maybe at the end. And before further ado, I'd like also to welcome, sitting quietly in the background, um, Josefina Comporali. Josefina, are you there? I am indeed. Let's hello to Josefina. Let's have a glimpse of you, if we may, before um, we move on with our conversation. Let's see you on screen. Hello. There she is. Yeah, I really don't want you to be a disembodied voice because um, this is Josefina Comporali, um, who is an editor, academic and translator of Matai's work into English. And she's kindly agreed to sit in on the conversation to help Matai um, with translation should he need it. So thank you all of you for coming. And Josefina, I'm sure we'll be able to call on you quite easily. I'll just say the magic word, Josefina, and you'll appear like magic. Thank you so much. Okay. Now, there is no shorthand, I don't think, that can do justice to our guests tonight. Um, do look at their biographies on their website. That's why the biographies are there. But for the context of this conversation, let me just remind you that Elif Shavak is a Turkish, British novelist, academic, public speaker and activist. Matai Vishnek is a Romanian, French playwright, novelist and poet. Now, both of you, I've described you almost as hybrid humans or hyph with hyphenated identities. Um, is that how you see yourselves, Elif? Uh, well, first of all, it's really, really wonderful to, to be able to do this together. Um, right. I'm very excited about, about this event. I think I do see myself and human beings, all of us, in terms of multiple belongings rather than singular identities. And in this age, especially, it feels important to me to defend multiplicity. When I look at myself, of course, I'm very attached to Turkey, to Istanbul, particularly. I think it's very visible in my work. But I also am very connected to the Balkans in general. Bring me next to a Romanian author, a Greek author, a Bulgarian author, a Bosnian author. I have so much in common. Equally, I have elements in my soul from the Middle East. I'm a European by, I'm European by birth, the values that I share. I became a Londoner and a British citizen. And despite what politicians have been telling us, especially because of Brexit, I would like to call myself as a citizen of humanity, a citizen of the world. That doesn't mean you're floating in the air aimlessly. I think it means you can care about many things simultaneously. Matai Vishnik, is that how you 
see yourself as well as multiple identities? Yes, in fact, I'm so glad to hear uh, Alif because sometimes I, I, I think we talk too much about identity and we are looking for only one identity, but we can bear some more identities inside our soul. I can say me too that I was born in a very beautiful region and I belong to this region. And I say I'm born in a small town, my identity is there, I have my root there. But of course, my identity is the Romanian language because I wrote, I discovered uh, the world in Romanian. Then I moved to France, but when I went to France, I discovered that I was like home in France because my culture prepared, in fact, the school, the books prepared me to feel in Paris like home. Uh, being French for me, it's, it wasn't a sort of strange revelation. I still feel home in France, like I still home in Europe and on this planet, in fact. Uh, of course, I have two very strong identities because I write in two languages. And finally, the liberty which uh, these two languages bring to me is perhaps the, the, the most important identity for me. But be, be, because um, I'm so glad to talk now with, uh, with uh, Elif Sh uh, Shafak and I know many people from Romania are watching us and I can say that I'm a bit, uh, um, how do you call it, uh, uh, a bit um, a bit moved uh, because um, if you know you have many uh, books published in Romania, at least eight, nine novels and we have the same editor, the same uh, uh, publishing house and it's so interesting to meet like that we are already published by the same editor, but it's, it was the right moment perhaps to have this talk. And I'm sure many people from Romania are watching now because you are here. Thank you for giving your time to us, uh, <laughs> Elif. Matai, it, it means so much to me to hear this from you. I really appreciate it. And we were talking about this earlier. I always feel connected. To, I mean, I, throughout my own literary journey, I read so many Romanian philosophers, writers, translated into Turkish. Uh, I read them both in Turkish and English, and each left an impact on me, including your voice. So I feel so much, there's so much in common, the way we talk about identity, the, 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 the way we talk about belonging, exile, but also memory. Um, the things we can and can't forget, collective memory, there's a lot that resonates with me when I read Romanian authors and philosophers. So I'm, I'm very happy that, and I, like you, I feel this was the right time to, I'm glad our roads, our paths crossed. This is just wonderful. Um, now, Mata, let's, let's um, look at those first 30 years in Romania. You were born in, in 1956 in Romania, Northern Romania. Tell me about, tell us, me, Elif, about those first 30 years, what it was like, because you were living under communism, you were living in the last, in the last, you were living under Ceausescu, and you left in 1987, so before Ceausescu and the, the revolution, before he was executed. Yes, I, I am born in the wrong part of Europe, <laughs> if, we, if we can say that. Uh, I discovered very quickly, in fact, that the country in which I was born, it wasn't a normal country because people used to talk around me. My father used to listen to the um, 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 uh, radio from abroad, from BB, uh, used to, to have news only from the radio uh, broadcasting from abroad. For, from BBC, from Free Europe, from Voice of America. And very quickly, I understood that we are living in a strange country where you have to say one thing at home and another thing at school. It was a sort of schizophrenia, how do you call it in English? A sort of schizophrenia in all of us. And very quick, quick, quickly, I discovered literature, 
as the only space of liberty, really fantastic for me, where I, I, I felt free, where I felt that my imagination was uh, 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 really uh, motivated. And very quickly, at 11, 12, I started to write poetry because it was like another language, a sort of uh, uh, code code uh, uh, language. A coded, a coded yeah. language. And I used to say so many things in this code uh, code language, and people were able to understand me. That is one of the reasons I, I uh, started to wrote very quickly, but it was a sort of phenomenon at that moment. Very many young people used to write poetry. The poetry and literature really uh, uh, was a sort of... Uh, uh, source of oxygen at that moment. And when I went to Bucharest to study history and philosophy, I really understood that literature was a sort of cultural resistance. It was a sort of way to say, nobody can um, uh, brush our brain entirely because we can defend us. Poetry, theater, novels, Literature, of course, uh, arts were a sort of um, anti -car. Uh, <laughs> uh, Well, and little by little in Bucharest, I discovered that theater, more than uh, novels or than uh, poetry, was a space of resistance because people, uh, living people, in front of uh, living uh, actors used to make a sort of complicity. And every show, every play I saw in Bucharest uh, at that moment was a sort of uh, uh, protestation, a sort of uh, you know, a manifestation again against uh, uh, the power. That was very quickly my, 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 my school of uh, uh, as a young writer and I understood very quickly as well that an artist has to be subversive, in fact, if he wants to be recognized as a true artist. Of course, it's much more complicated than, than, than that. I understood as well that you have to write good stories before to be a subversive writer. But it was for me a sort of mission to bring both dimensions together to be a good writer, but a subversive one as well. Bravo. And, and you, you, you discovered theatre, as you say, but you weren't, and you, you wrote plays, but you weren't actually performed um, because your plays were banned um, under Ceausescu. Is, is that correct? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. In fact, what I wanted, of course, was to have my place produced. I used to uh, bring to, to, to show them, uh, to, to, to uh, propose them to actors, to directors, to uh, all people involved in, in, in theatrical life. Of course, my plays were banned or refused, but for me, that was a, a proof that I was on the right side. In fact, I was very happy to see that my place doesn't fit with the ideology or, uh, uh, or uh, the, 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 the rules of the power. I had some very short plays um, printed in some uh, magazines. I used to read them, to read them in um, uh, literary uh, cenacle uh, circles, you know. I used to, uh, what, uh, to read them to my friends but only my poems were uh, accepted by censorship. But for me, what, what was very important at that moment, it was to fight against the censorship, but as well to fight against the self-censorship. And I think this battle, I, 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 it, I was a winner. I never uh, 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 lotto censure. I never accepted the self-censorship. Uh, that was my experience there, and I'm sure that 
the artists, the most of them in Romania, uh, really um, accomplished their mission. Mm -hmm. uh, the novels, the poems were so much appreciated by, by the huge public. And in every novel, when somebody started to, to, to read a new novel, translated, for, translated from uh, foreign languages or, uh, or from written by Romanian uh, uh, writers, they, they, they were looking in these novels, the liberty or the criticize uh, uh, lines against the power. In fact, we started, we realized to demolish the ideology, this, this very oppressive uh, ideology through the literature. It was a mission of the literature at that moment. I think um, Elif will probably feel very strongly in favor of what you're saying. I just know, I know that Elif herself has spoken before about the liberty of literature, um, freedom in literature. And Elif, just to remind people as well that you were you weren't born in in Turkey, but you were you you grew up in Ankara. You were born in Strasbourg um, a little bit later than the matter, um, and um, and you, and then you grew up in Ankara, but you moved around quite a bit. But it is Turkey that is your your literary homeland. I would say. Tell us about your early years and when you started writing, when you saw literature and stories mm -hmm. as as your, your future? Um, I think what came first was my need for books. The desire to become a writer came later, but the need, it's almost like an existential need for books, that came to me very early on at a younger age. And there's a reason, not because I wanted to become a novelist, I didn't know such a thing was possible, I was a very lonely child. I was an only child and I thought life was very boring and literature opened up another space for me. So I realized that in Storyland, I found a home. Um, but before that, maybe I need to explain how I came to that point. I was born in Strasbourg to Turkish parents and the first house that I grew up in was full of immigrants, leftist students. You know, there, are, there were students from all backgrounds talking about revolution, uh, reading Louis Althusser, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, but not Simone de Beauvoir. You know, a lot of smoke, um, smoking lots of cigarettes and, and dreaming of revolution. So that was the setting. From that environment, I came to Ankara with my mother after my parents separated. My father stayed in France and my mother brought me to Turkey because for her, Turkey was motherland. For me, it was a new country completely to discover. And we came to my grandmother's house, which was in Ankara in a very conservative, very closed and patriarchal neighborhood where I felt like we were the old ones out. And from that moment onwards, I was raised by two women, by my mother and my grandmother. It was a bit unusual because I didn't grow up in a typical Turkish family. And I grew up observing the challenges that my mother had to go through as a single mother, as a divorcee, and how my traditional grandmother supported her in that journey. These two women were very different. I know it sounds a bit like a cliche, but in a way they were like East and West. You know, my mother is very modern, very urban, very rational, westernized, you might say. Grandma is pretty much the opposite, more spiritual, more superstitious, and she was an oral storyteller. And in that environment, I found books and I needed books. After that, I traveled a little bit, Spain, Amman, uh, Germany, back to Turkey. And then, I, and then I settled down in Istanbul. So I thought, because I thought Istanbul was calling me. I wrote many of my books in Istanbul. I, I, I lived long years in Istanbul and I still carry the city with me. But I, I also felt suffocated as a writer. So I went to Boston and then Michigan, and then Arizona, uh, back to Istanbul, and then 12 years ago, I came to the UK. The reason I'm mentioning all this is because life has been a bit nomadic. Even though I spent most of my life in Turkey, life has been a bit of, you know, more peripatetic, more nomadic. And I think I saw literature, the art of storytelling, as an existential glue that keeps my pieces together, that gives me a sense of center, 
And I always felt free in Storyland. Hmm. And if there's and there's so much now that I can tell we've got to talk about in this in this uh, very short hour it's going to be but let's um perhaps just look at a couple of your uh, your most recent titles because um the the titles themselves are quite ominous and prescient if you like um I think everything is ominous and prescient at the moment but um uh, last year 2019 um you had your wonderful Booker Prize shortlisted book 10 minutes 38 seconds in this strange world a very, very great title. And then just recently under lockdown, you've published um, How to Stay Sane in an Age of Division, another extraordinary piece of work. So the fiction and the nonfiction. Um, now, you, you don't necessarily tell us how to stay sane, um, but you do address the various issues as components of modern day um, sanity, such as power and mental health and all these other issues. Tell us a little bit about what brought you to write these two particular books very close together and in English of course you're writing in English now. Yes and, and I hope we will talk about these journeys between languages but with regards to um, um, these two books I think even though they're very different in my mind there are underground tunnels that connect them and especially the, the non-fiction book How to Stay Sane in an Age of Division it was something that was, was very much written in this moment in time. As, as you know, Doris Lessing has this beautiful quote in one of her essays, she describes literature as analysis after the event. I understand that and, and I respect that because we need time as writers, events happen and then we need to digest it, we need to process it and then we write. So in that regard, literature is written in retrospect. However, We've also entered an age in which literature has to become analysis during the event, while things are happening. And so this book was very much written in that moment of pandemic when the lockdown started. And I realized I was struggling with anxiety, anger, fear, or confusion. And then you look around, you, see, you realize you're not the only one. So I wanted to start with emotions and try to see if there's a way to turn these emotions into a more constructive, more positive force. But if I may add this, my main starting point is this. We're living in a world in which digital technologies were supposed to give everyone an equal voice, right? We were supposed to be all democratized, you know, all countries were going to embrace democracy thanks to advances in digital technologies and all that kind of optimism which never came to be realized. But here we are in the, in the age of information, in the age of social media, and in the age of populism as well. And so many people feel voiceless. Mm -hmm. So many people feel like their voices are unheard. And there's a lot of sorrow, there's a lot of hurt. And I wanted to write, uh, address that part in particular. How does it feel to feel, to, to be voiceless? And we want to live in a world in which our voices are heard and we can tell stories that have been untold until that moment. And what you do is in everything you write, I mean, as you know, because I've interviewed you um, luckily many times, is that you write, you, you, you never provide solutions as such, but you examine ideas and you give us hope. You always give us hope. But you say in this book, How to Stay Sane, you say it's okay to feel not okay. It's, yeah. okay. it's fine to feel not fine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You're amongst friends, in other words. <laughs> yes, and it's more truthful because we don't need to impose on ourselves this, you know, we don't need to, this forced optimism. Um, and this is one of the things that I wanted to talk to Matai uh, about. I think when you open a map of Europe, and you look at the river Danube, the, the blue Danube, as you trace it with your finger from Germany towards the Black Sea, as you move towards east, the level of optimism drops. So by the time you reach Romania, Turkey, Bulgaria, we're not very optimistic cultures and we have a reason, you know, we have complicated histories. I, all I'm saying is maybe it's okay for the mind to be more of a pessimist but the heart has to remain more of an optimist. And that's why I quote that uh, from Gramsci when he talks about pessimism of the intellect and the optimism of the heart. 
We need both in this age. We need a dose of pessimism to understand what's happening in the world, to see what is at stake, to be more aware, but also we need an element of optimism to keep us, and that is gonna come from our fellow human beings and it's gonna come from literature and art. And you, you spoke about the tunnels joining your two books, um, 10 minutes, 38 seconds in this strange world with um, your Age of Division um, book. And I know that there are tunnels, you know, having read both of them, but again, with that novel, with this story of Leila, um, the, 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 the prostitute with the good heart, if you like, um, in Istanbul, you cover so much ground, but you also give us so much warmth and great hope in spite of her awful, terrible life and her death. Um, it starts with her death. So where are the tunnels? Tell me about that tunnel linking those two books and then we'll, we'll um, because there's a lot that Matai I'm sure will have to say about hearing all this. Yes, and I, I was also very interested in what Matai said about self-censorship, so, so important because again, I come from a country where because of a poem you write, because of a novel you write, or because of something you say in an interview, you can get into trouble so easily. So there is censorship that comes from above, but then there's also the self-censorship that we internalize sometimes without being aware of it. And the second thing maybe that I want to add is people realize that it's not easy to talk about politics or political taboos, political issues, but sometimes people don't realize that it's equally challenging to write about gender, to write about patriarchy, to write about sexuality, that too is political. So easily you can find yourself getting into trouble for questioning gender violence or sexual harassment and issues like that. Uh, and I think that's also important when we discuss self-censorship. Are we free as writers? We need to ask that question to ourselves. Uh, very shortly about the novel, it has a very unusual beginning. As you know, it starts with an end. Um, it is the last 10 minutes, 38 seconds in the life of a woman, a sex worker in Istanbul. After that book was published in Turkey, um, I, I learned that police officers came to my Turkish publishing house asking for copies of the novel and also one of my earlier novels called The Gaze. And the prosecutor investigated this book for a so-called crime of obscenity. And the only reason I want to mention this is because I think we need to talk about gender and sexuality also uh, and, the, and the challenges of writing on these issues for writers. Matt, I, I think that's um, throwing it open to you because you spoke about being proud, um, partly being proud of being censored under uh, communism because you knew you were doing the right thing by being censored. But what does it do um, to a writer if they are condemned by their own country in the way that Elif was describing what happened to her. It must, it must be very painful. Yes, of course, uh, when I left Romania in 87, and I, I would like to say that I liked a lot this, uh, this part about being optimistic and pessimistic in the same time. When I left the country, Romania in 87, I was sure that the dictatorship, communist, the state communist, will still be there for hundred and hundred years. Nobody uh, uh, died in, in 87, even in 88 to say that one day the communists will collapse so quickly. I moved to France, I was sure that it was forever. And I was sure that in Romania, we will have a sort of dynasty, communist dynasty like in North Korea. Of course, then the history started to accelerate and I was so happy and still I am now so happy to see that in Eastern Europe, we had, we had so huge changes. In fact, everything changed. Romania is now, it belongs to the to, uh, Uni European Union. Uh, the um, liberty of the circulation is so something so important. When I left Romania and I crossed the border, the first border, I was in a train from Romania to Hungary. I was sure that the uh, political uh, uh, police will come 
to stop me and to say, it's okay, Matei, now you go back to Bucharest, you go back to your uh, town because uh, we are not so silly. I know, we know that you want to, to, to go to, to the West. Uh, don't dream so quickly. And then I crossed to, to Hungary and I said, they are much more perfect. They will stop me at the border with the Autriche, uh, uh, Austrian. Austria, Austria. And then I crossed the border and I, the train uh, went through the Austria. And for the first time in my life, I was 31, I felt something very strange, uh, liberty, to be free. That was at that moment, Eastern Europe, a prison, a true prison. And when I uh, arrived to Paris, I had a sort of bursary. Uh, I wrote my first novel uh, about uh, Mr. K liberated because it was a sort of therapeutic, uh, therapeutic uh, novel to understand myself what liberty means and how to use it. But then I started to write, uh, to, to, to work as a, as a journalist. I went to, to London to work uh, one year for BBC, for the Romanian section of BBC. Then I worked since 90, uh, uh, 99, uh, 90, uh, yes, I, I'm working for 30 years now for um, French International Radio. And it happened something in, in, my, in my soul, in my being. I'm, there are two persons in me. The journalist is something here and the writer is something here. And the, the journalist slowly, he become very pessimistical because the world is a bit crazy even the Europe uh, turned in a very strange direction. There are so many countries where the democracy collapsed and the journalist who is in me is more and more pessimistic. But fortunately, the writer is still in me and are saying, no, we don't have to give up, we have to fight because the human being is so special, so contradictory, but the human being has imagination. It must be something very good inside. We have to hope, we have to, to, to keep the hope alive. That is the, the, the manner in which the both persons which are in me are collaborating. Sometimes the journalist says, I'm fed up, they are all crazy. This world is a horror. I give up, bye-bye. I... But the writer takes some subjects from the journalist and in my place, I'm trying to understand better the world and the human being. And in that way, I, I am in the same time pessimist, pessimistic or and optimistic in the same time. And uh, just to finish, um, 20, I think I was for the first time in Turkey uh, 20 years ago to see one of my plays in Istanbul. It was uh, called uh, Old Clown Wanted. It was produced, uh, directed by a woman, a very good director, Müge Gürman. I don't know uh, uh, if Elif uh, Shafak, if you know her. She used to work for the National Theater in Istanbul. And when I discovered for the first time Turkey and Istanbul, I was so astonished and happy because I, I saw the liberty was there, in fact. Even if there were two countries in only one, but in Istanbul, I saw so many young people, so free, in fact. And for the radio, I used to write at that moment many articles about how Turkey is a model, how to harmonize how to uh, make a, a good cohabitation between Islam and democracy. It was a model. Five years ago, when I go to, I went to Istanbul for another, another uh, uh, play, it was much more sad, the atmosphere. And it's really a pity that in Europe, the European model wasn't able to open the other countries around Mediterranean, Mediterranean, 
to democracy. This uh, is the tragedy of my old age, if you say, if you want. But as uh, Nietzsche said, uh, it's the only um, citation I like. Quote, 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 quote yes. foundation. We have to act as if the progress does exist. It's not bad. Mm -hmm. You spoke about Istanbul and, um, and I just wanted to ask you both what those cities, what those countries mean to you now you've been away for so long because Elif, you haven't been back for a long time have you you can't go back and um and Mata, you you've been back to to Bucharest I know and you've had your plays performed in Bucharest and you're a, you're a hero in in Romania which must be wonderful you know after after the the decades of not enjoying that but I wonder what those cities those countries mean to you now Elif what does Istanbul mean to you here now I think it, it's there's this very deep, strong emotional attachment that never changes. Wherever I am, I feel like Istanbul does come with me. And early on, you were asking me about the underground tunnels connecting the two books. Um, I think it's visible in, 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 in my novels that there is a desire to tell the stories of Istanbul that have not been told in the, in the main narrative. There is a desire, I have a desire to, to look at the periphery rather than the center. Of course, as a writer, I'm interested in stories. I'm, I love language, I love the rhythm of language, but I'm equally interested in silences and people who have been silenced. So rather than the center, it's always the margins that I want to pay attention. And that is the Istanbul that I carry with me not the Istanbul that the Ministry of Tourism presents, but the Istanbul of untold stories, the Istanbul in the margins, the underbelly of the society, the minorities, women's lives, the lives of sexual minorities, ethnic minorities. With all that complexity, Istanbul keeps coming with me. And also I realized as I was writing this novel, 10 minutes, 38 seconds, most of the things that we remember, we remember through emotions, and we remember through, through senses, like seemingly small things, maybe the smell of street food or the sound of a, just, just a melody that is very familiar. Those are the moments that trigger bigger memories in, in our minds. So the Istanbul that I carry with me and I, that I reflect in my, in my writing is, is very sensual at the same time. Mata, how is it for you with, with Bucharest and Romania? I mean, I know that because I've only been able to read some of your work because not as much as necessary and should be translated into English has been translated. But thanks to Josefina and um, a couple of other people, we have got quite a lot, but not enough really to give me an overview of your work. I know you write so-called absurdist plays. You love surrealism. I think you, you said very cleverly once, um, you love all realisms except social realism, which I thought was very funny, um, very clever, but I'm sure very true. So um, tell us about what you write and how much of Romania is in that writing. In fact, many, many years after I left Romania, I still wrote about liberty, the manipulation of the people by a power, by the power about communism as well, but not only about utopia, about ideology, how the ideology can oppress people, even if the ideology uh, seems to be such a very, very uh, uh, promising uh, system of ideas. After 89, I started to go back to Romania to, to, to participate to the cultural life in Romania. As I, I work for uh, the Romanian section section of uh, French International Radio. In fact, every day with my head, with my soul, with my articles, because I broadcast, I'm broadcasting in Romania, I am in Romania. Uh, I, I, I go there usually four or five times a year. I go for the festival, for uh, book uh, fairs and so on. And I'm very happy to say that Romania finally now is a normal country because 
we have democracy. We have the absolutely liberty of uh, to write what we what we want to publish what we want. The debates are free. It's a democratic country. It's a normal country with uh, a normal economy. That is a part the black side, if you want, of the portrait of my country. When I I know that three million or four millions of Romanians, Romanians are working abroad, it's like a signal. It's not normal. Uh, if, uh, of course, uh, if uh, four millions of Romanians go to work abroad only one year, perhaps it's okay, two years, 10 years, 15 years, but for so many long, so many years, Romanians are not able to build a strong economy in their country. I wrote a play about the empty houses in the villages in Romania, in my region, for example. There are so many villages with hundreds and hundreds of empty houses. People are in Italy, in Spain, in Germany, working hard, in fact, in farms and so on, because they are, they are not very, very uh, specialized, you know. Some of them are doctors, of course, but most of them are people working in farms and they are building houses in their villages and the houses are empty 10 or 11 months a year. Only in August, they go back, all of them with big cars, with kids, to see them, each other, to have a moment together. This is something very hard to, 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 to understand and to accept. And I think the, we, we cannot say all the time is, a, is a, the Union, European Union is guilty, but a bit, a bit, it is guilty because the economy wasn't equilibrated in inside Un uh, uh, European Union. We have still to done a, a, a huge work to, equilib to equilibrate economy in Europe. Well, in Romania, we don't have a nationalist party like in some other countries, but for a while I discovered that religion, religion, it's too, too close to politics. And I'm always scared when these two planets um, comes too close, politics and religion. There is a sort of uh, danger here. Well, and uh, I'd like to say to, to Elif that uh, many, I think, feminist uh, activists are uh, reading uh, your uh, books because there is there is a feminist uh, movement in Romania. And I'm sure some uh, feminists are uh, from Romania are uh, watching us in this moment. I would like to read only three or four titles of your novels in Romanian, just for the music of uh, the titles. You will understand very quickly, uh, perhaps, uh, the, the titles. Bastarda Istanbulului, Ucenicul Arhitectului, Cele Patruzeci de Legi Ale Iubirii, Lapte Negro, Black Milk, or Cele Trei Fice Ale Evei. It sounds so good, so nice, so interesting, <laughs> these titles in Romania. I can assure you that you have good translators and a lot of readers, uh, uh, <laughs> Elif. If the nor normality comes back quickly next year, really it would be so interesting to have meetings in Romania with, uh, with um, people, with readers and the feminist uh, uh, activists as well. Because it's only at the beginning this moment yeah. and all this subject you are talking about uh, genre, uh, sexual, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, culture. I, these subjects are 
recent in Romania. Yeah, it, it means a lot to me, you know, what, what you're saying. And I am aware that the translations into Romanian uh, of my novels are, are, are good thanks to the work of the translators, right? So I owe a big, big thank you. They, they you know, tra translation creates wonders. It's, it's so, so important. I'm very much aware of that. And I'm also aware of the fact that there is a, there is an important uh, women's movement and questioning in, Ro in Romania because I follow on social media and I'm very excited to see that because we have a long way to go. There are inequalities that we need to change and we need to challenge. But if I may say this, the, the, the kind of feminism that I believe in, the kind of women's movement that I believe in brings on board people from different backgrounds. First of all, brings on board women from different um, cultural backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds, but also men, especially young men. Because coming from a patriarchal country like Turkey, I have seen so many times, of course, it's not easy to be a woman in Turkey, but it's not easy to be a man either. You know, where, where there is patriarchy, it's not easy to be a young man. If you do not fit into the definition of masculinity, yes. for whatever reason, your life can be very difficult. And sometimes women can judge you too. So we have to open up horizons and we need to bring men on board. We need to bring sexual minorities together uh, I am very interested in meeting Romanian youth, you know, young readers in particular. So I'm aware of the complexity of the civil society in Romania, and I'm aware of how much you have done in terms of uh, changing from an authoritarian regime into democracy. That is a journey that gives countries like mine hope. You know, it's, it's an important journey. So there's a lot we need to talk about. And one more thing I want to add, when I look at my own country, it has a long, long history, but that doesn't mean we have a strong memory. I think we are a society of collective amnesia in Turkey. Um, Istanbul, we were talking about earlier, it's a city of urban amnesia and memory matters, not in order to get stuck in the past, but to learn from the past. So when writers talk about the stories, the untold stories, they're also bringing back memory into collective amnesia. And I find that important as well so that we can become more mature, so that we can face the mistakes that we have made in the past as different countries, learn from those mistakes and hopefully never to make them again. So I think memory is also a big part. Memory and empathy are big, big parts of, of our work. You've both also spoken about translation and language, and, um, and I just wanted to give a couple of titles also of Matai Vishniak's work because the ones we have in English, and um, because the titles themselves are so wonderful. Um, there's the anthology of, um, of plays, which Josefina Comporali has, um, has translated and edited, which is called How to Explain the History of Communism to Mental Patients and other plays. And there's a, um, this, this one play in there called The Feeling of Elasticity When Walking on Dead Bodies. And I know there's a novel that's coming out too, which you wrote quite a long time ago. I think you, you referred to it just now called um, The Release of Mr. K, which has just been um, translated by Josephina into English. And I wonder, um, it, these are absurd titles <laughs> and they're absurdist ideas. And I know your love of absur absurdity and UNESCO um, and so on, Eugene Unesco, and you live in France, whether that connection with absurdity and um, absurd theater and writing has stayed with you consistently or whether you're, you're falling in love with it again, because I think it is an age of absurdity as well as it's an age of divisions and insanity and all the other issues we've been discussing. So do you love your absurdity still as much as you did? For me, just to say that when I discovered the world, I discovered that I was living in an absurd world. In effect, when I read for the first time UNESCO and Beckett and Kafka, all of a sudden I saw, look, they helped me to understand who I am, where I live, and what are my opportunities. In fact, reading the absurd theater, reading these uh, these authors, 
they gave me a sort of, of instrument to understand the world. And for me, the history was absurd in my country, not the literature of uh, UNESCO or Beckett. They offered me only keys to understand my world. Of course, I liked so much uh, at that moment. Uh, and and we, we, they were translated, in fact. Uh, it wasn't uh, difficult to found them. And even uh, UNESCO and Beckett, they were produced in Romania. It was a kind of schizophrenia in that country because we had access to this literature, but in the same time, when I wanted me to write something very special, the power used to say me, no, you have to respect the social socialist realism. Well, that is another story. Uh, finally, even today, I think the absurd literature, UNESCO, Beckett, uh, Arabal, uh, gives us keys to understand why today le langage, the language, no, the, le langage is so complicated. Even I, I, I wonder if the, this new sort of ideology of uh, political correctness, for me, it is, is a part of the absurd theater in, in a way, you know, because it's a way to practice the self-censorship. I think we still need all these authors to be able to understand what is happened in the so society and even in our uh, uh, contradictory uh, soul. You're both talking in a language which is not your native language. You're speaking to me and us in English and um, you live in France, um, Matai, and you've been living in France for a number of decades now and you write in France, you write plays in France and you publish in French. And Elif is writing in English and um, it's speaking to us in English now and I know you speak several other languages. But what does it mean to have so many languages at your disposal? Is it, is it confusing or is it liberating? Elif? I think I, I can't generalize because every writer's path journey might be different. In my case, I love languages and I love the commute between languages. And I think we're living in an age in which you can dream in more than one language. And if you can dream in more than one language, because the mind doesn't recognize those boundaries. Maybe in your dreams, you can see words in French, words in Romanian. It, it, it's possible, the mind blends them. I can also write fiction in more than one language if that's how I feel. This was very difficult to explain in Turkey because I used to write, my first novels were written in Turkish first. And then about 15 years ago, I switched to writing in English first. And this was very unusual and, and people reacted in a very nationalistic way, as they often do, and saying, you know, if that, so she's not a Turkish writer anymore, they started saying, if she, because she has abandoned her mother tongue. But that's the problem with nationalism. It's always either or. Are you here? Are you there? Are you one of us? Are you one of them? Whereas I believe you can write in more than one language. You can commute between languages like James Baldwin used to describe himself as a commuter. And to this day, um, that's, this is how I feel. I haven't abandoned my mother tongue. I feel very attached to Turkish and I feel very attached to the English language. My connection with the Turkish language is more emotional. My connection with the English language is more cerebral. And I need both. There is no doubt in my mind that I'm an immigrant. I'm an Im immigrant inside the English language. To me, this is an acquired language. The mind always runs faster than the tongue and the tongue always tries to catch up but fails to do so. That is the experience of being an immigrant. You're aware of this gap that you can never ever close. And you accept that and you move on with that. So in a nutshell, all I can say, it gives me a sense of freedom, this movement between languages. I need that freedom. Mm -hmm. And I realize if my writing has sorrow, melancholy, longing, I find these things much easier to express in Turkish. But when it comes to humor, which is very important for me, and irony and satire, 
I find these things much easier in English. In Turkish, we don't even have a word for irony. We don't do irony, right? So in, in each language, you find a different anchor for yourself. <laughs> I'm glad you brought up humour because it, it is it, you are very funny in English. I know for a fact. And, and Matt, I, um, you write—is this correct? You write um, your prose and your poetry in Romanian, and yes. your plays in French. Yes, yes, yes. In fact, when I uh, moved to France, I started to write in French, and I discovered something very special, very interesting for a playwright. Playwright, I discovered how important it is sometimes to be poor. Poor, I want to say, not to be a king in your language. I was a king in Romanian. I, I was able to do what I wanted with the Romanian language, to destroy the grammar, to invent words. In French, I was obliged to be humble and to be very careful at each line to, to be sure to say. I was poor, but in the same time, I tried to be rich with the construction with the, uh, of my play, for example. Uh, I wanted to obtain the maximum, the, the, the most uh, effects with the minimum, the, 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 with few um, uh, meanings or, uh, and it was like a, stylistic exercise and to have as well the feeling to be born again in another language and the most important thing for, in fact I was born in a country where I knew what that means the cultural complex French helped me a lot as a writer because the most uh, of my plays uh, abroad were translated from French. And again, a very important thing, French, France is still a paradise for theater. So many companies, so many authors, I wrote for companies asking for me to write plays for them. It was really a sort of cadeau for me to live in France and to write in French. Of course, I translated in Romanian every play I wrote in France, in French. It was a site of uh, <laughs> natural uh, mission for me. Sadly, we're coming to the end of our, our time together, our hour together. And I just wanted to um, touch on this particular time now, this pandemic period. Now, you're both very used to having very full diaries and traveling a lot. I think Elif used the word cultural nomads. I mean, you both are nomads with your plays. You go and give lectures and... Um, you know, you attend premieres of your plays and, and so on and so forth. And festivals, of course, festivals. And we've not been able to do any of that um, for the last you know, eight, nine months. And of course, the theatres are closed, which must be of great pain to you, Matai, and for all of us. And I just wonder how you are spending this pandemic time. I know that Elif has written one short a book of essays um, is it important for you to hibernate and to, um, to take this as a break? Or do you feel that you have to document it? First of all, I miss literary festivals, cultural festivals. And I honestly believe they're among our last remaining democratic spaces. We need to defend and embrace cultural festivals and events even more today because we need them. Uh, there is a danger when when we when you go something as severe as a pandemic and economic inequalities. Sometimes politicians think that art is a luxury, that culture is a luxury, that um, these are not the priorities in this urgent moment in time. We need to say this out loud and clear. In my opinion, that art is not a luxury. It is as essential as the bread we need, as the as the water we thirst for. Um, so it's very important to me that we never give up on actual festivals, actual events. But that said, I find digital events also very important because what I have observed earlier, we were talking about this, you, you have people who might not easily access to those venues, 
now able to log in and follow the events. This is important. We should, we should not lose. Maybe from now on, we're going to change the model. Maybe we're going to have both actual festivals and digital festivals. But what matters is that we need books because we're living in an age of too much information, very little knowledge, and even less wisdom. And I think we need to change this ratio. We don't need this much bombardment of information. We can't even process it. We need true, proper knowledge. But ultimately, we need more wisdom. And for knowledge, we need to slow down. We need books. We need culture, art. For wisdom, hopefully, we need to bring the mind and the heart together and emotional intelligence and empathy. So all I can say is I believe our need for stories and literature will, will be here to stay. Matai, how is this time for you? Have you been as busy as ever? I mean, you can't travel, you can't go to the theater. I work very hard as well, all the time I'm thinking. And sometimes I'm saying to myself, we needed a break, we, humanity. If the virus is a character, perhaps we can image this uh, scene, uh, the virus comes to, to, to the human uh, uh, being, uh, human uh, and says, I will disappear when you, the man, the human being will become clever than you were before. I think we have to think of that is a sort of metaphor, of course, but it's a good moment to change something, generally speaking, in the world, because everything used to go too quickly. It's the right moment to think, to talk, to debate, to understand better what we want and to change something in the future. This is my feeling in this moment. Well, I'd like to thank you both so much. And if anybody ever doubts that there can be alchemy or magic in a virtual public space like this, I think um, these two wonderful people have proven us very wrong. Um, thank you so much to Elif and Matan. I want to bring in um, Josefina very quickly um, back on screen and to apologize to Josefina that for Matai's English that was so good. <laughs> oh, in fact, I talk a lot with my hands and with my head. <laughs> This is the reason I didn't. <laughs> well, I'm so <laughs> glad you didn't need me because it would have possibly broken this magic between you. So, you yes. so well, when you are not very far, believe me, thank you very much. And well, thank you very much for everything you've done for my theater and my novel, uh, Josefina. Josefina. Thank you for writing these pieces. Wonderful. And, and, and hopefully, you know, one day um, we'll all be back together in this wonderful festival that um, Elif describes, which we all love so much, these, these coming together. But I want to thank you all and Elif Shafak and Matai Vishnik, and um, particularly for actually lifting all our spirits, making us smile. I, I've been smiling through the whole, <laughs> the whole thing. <laughs> thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.